And he, you're just a bitch, self-centered mm-hmm. little bitch. All you do is care about yourself. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Pretty mean language. Yeah. So what you say, what you say to yourself is I'm feeling really disrespected right now. I feel insulted. I feel disrespected. I don't feel like I'm being understood. And it kind of makes me sad. And I feel a little bit of embarrassment that, about this because it's not, doesn't comport with my identity of who I am myself. And that person's really angry and sad and alone and frightened. And all she can do is attack me. And I'm sad that I'm the punching bag, the target. You see how you process it? Just like that. And all of a sudden the charge goes away. Welcome back. We are on today with my guest Doug Noll on the tour for the shit podcast. I'm your host, Angie Sorensen. Listen, if you love this podcast or if you enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to share with a friend. Give it a five star rating. You can also leave a review. All of it is free. It's always free to listen to this podcast. And, you know, whether you are listening to it from Spotify, Apple Podcasts, but Radio FM, Amazon Music, Stitcher, all of the platforms, it's free to listen to it. And however you can show some love within that platform, I would love it if you just took just a little second and just did it and just click on a five star Write a review, it can just be sweet and short. So that, yeah, love it, you know. Hey, however, whatever you wanna whatever you wanna say. But it really, really, really helps. And I really appreciate it when you do. It's the best way for me to actually get this podcast out in front of more uh ears. So um but yeah, so there you go. And so without you, this wouldn't be possible. So really, really thank you so much. So on to today's episode with Doug. Uh, Doug is someone who used to be a trial lawyer and he turned peacemaker. So what he's been doing for the last 22 years is that he's been going into the prisons and basically help prisoners become mediators and help de-escalate conflict. And so um, I was really curious as to how he does that and I really wanted him to come on and share some of his techniques and how actually maybe we can use that for us, us on the outside, and how we can maybe change our mindset and how we actually view arguments and conflicts and how we can de-escalate a conflict. Um, Because, you know, I mean, you probably know by now, I do find that navigating human relationships can be really challenging. Like, I really wish I had a a decoder. (laughs) I really do. Oh, God. Um, So... So yeah, so if you know, it's, it's almost impossible to go through life and not actually have a conflict. Um, and just avoiding it and pretend everything is okay, well, it doesn't really cut it anymore. So so yeah, so I really wanted to come on and I, um, I hope that you find this episode useful. Of course, I wish I had four extra hours with Doug because we couldn't get through everything. And of course, you know, he, what his method he obviously that is also his living so he can't just also just share everything on here but uh i really wish i had an extra four hours which is impossible you know we all have limited amount, limited amount of, t- of time but really um i have actually found this this hour really useful and i've learned a few things and i've learned about a couple of my blind spots and so yeah, I really, uh, I would love to hear from you what you think of this episode. You know, what are your takeaways? Like, do you, have you found this useful? Have you not? Do you want to find out more about this? Would you like me to get more guests on this? And also, actually, <laughs> I'm going to, um, uh, I guess, like, uh, speak something into hopefully existence. I've been trying to get a guest on um, who actually would have been you know, who has been wrongfully incarcerated and then found innocent, you know, years later because obviously there are organizations out there that are trying to help. It hasn't actually been easy to to get uh, someone on. So if you do um, know of anyone who would love to speak about their experience uh, or someone who actually really know about this and who would be willing to come on the podcast and share this with me, I would be so grateful. Um, look, you know where to find me. Um, I'll put the link in the show notes. Surprise, surprise. But yeah, if you go to angie-s.com, 
you you can you can email me directly from from there um yeah so you can also you know find me on instagram and just slide into my dms and uh let me know um yeah i think my, my instagram is true for the shit podcast let me actually just check this. This is how terrible I am about social media. I have to actually check my handle. Yeah. Two for the <laughs> Yeah. Two for the shit podcast. I was correct. Look at that. Look at that. Improvements. So yeah. So I would really love to hear your thoughts. And also just a little heads up at the end, Doug very kindly shares that he made a website link for you as my listeners. So it's like dognor.co and then forward slash two old. But I just want to clarify that I'm not an affiliate. So it is a personalized uh, link for you as the listeners. But I am not affiliate. So whether you go directly through his website, docknall.co, or go through that link in the show notes, it is completely up to you. It has nothing to do with me. Uh, I am not affiliate. But yes, so I am not earning anything on this. So yeah, I just wanted to be transparent on that. Because if I ever am an affiliate on anything, I do say it. Um up top so so that you know uh what's going on and so without further ado please help me give a big warm welcome to doug let's begin hi doug angie how are you i'm good how are you i'm doing great beautiful late spring day here in central california <laughs> look a big, big welcome to the tool for the shit podcast thank you so much for joining me today I am really, really excited to have you on the podcast because when I read about what you do and I saw a few of the things like on your on your website, some of the videos, I was like, I, I have to, I have to speak to you. And what we're going to talk about today is is your work uh, on how to de-escalate conflicts and how your work with prison inmates as well. How? Let me rephrase that. <laughs> like basically, the work that you do with the prison inmates on how they can sort of de-escalate conflicts and how they can become me mediator and so on and so forth. We're going to dive deeper into that in a minute. Like that just really blew me away. So before we dive in, Doug, please introduce yourself, where you live and what you do. So my name is Doug Knoll and I live in rural California in almost the exact center of the state in the Western United States, actually about 60 miles south of Yosemite National Park. And I have 10 acres living in the central Sierra Nevada mountains with my wife and my little border collie puppy. And I am a unique profession. I am a lawyer turned peacemaker, which we can talk about. And essentially what I do among, as well as being an author, a teacher, a trainer, speaker, and visionary is that I help people resolve deep and intractable conflicts of all different kinds. So when the stakes are high and the emotions are high, I get called in to help people find peace. And I've been doing that for 20, full-time for 22 years now, since I left the practice of law. That line of work has always been relevant. You know, we always think that we change as a society, but you know, like the more, the more you look into it, I mean, the more I like, I read like historical books and stuff, I kind of think it's the same stuff happening over and over again. It's the same shit we keep doing. And I, but I think the difference now is that I feel it's so even more heightened because there's such a, deep polarity and such a, a bubble world you know everyone lives in their own bubble on on with the social media and the internet how it works you just keep just seeing the same things that agree with you and so you never really evolve and so when you see something or have a question about things people are not they're not equipped to handle it and it just becomes into a conflict whereas before it may have been a bit more of a conversation or heated conversation right so it's such a relevant work that you do really important work and um, what got you into this line of work? Like, out of everything you could have chosen, because like you said, you, you were a lawyer by trade. So what got you into this? Well, I, when I graduated from law school, I moved to Central California and ultimately joined a firm that was engaged in bankruptcy and litigation work. And I was groomed to be a trial lawyer. And I did that for 22 years. In the mid-1980s, I took up the martial arts and about the time I turned 40, I was awarded my second degree black belt. And then after that, I took up Tai Chi, which is the oldest form of martial arts. And Tai Chi has two really interesting paradoxes. The one is the softer you are, the stronger you are. Mm -hmm. And the second is the more vulnerable you are, 
the more powerful you are. So soft to be strong, vulnerable to be powerful. And it took a long time for me to understand the truth of those paradoxes. But one day, some years later, I was in a courtroom cross-examining somebody, and the thought came to me, what the heck am I doing in here? And after that trial, I had a vacation plan, a whitewater trip up in Idaho. And during that week, uh, on the whitewater, doing, running the whitewater rapids all alone in my boat, um, just rowing through these big rapids, thinking about how many people I'd really served as a trial lawyer. And I could only count five people that I felt over the past 20 plus years that I had really served well. And I just thought, I'm not going to do this anymore. I don't want to go another 30 years and only really help 15 people. Mm. So I didn't know what I was going to do, but I came back to home after the vacation and was driving down out of the mountains to my office. And I heard a public service announcement on our local public radio station for a new master's degree in peacemaking and conflict studies being offered at our local Mennonite university. And as you may know, the Mennonites are one of the three traditional Protestant peace churches. And that caught my attention. So ultimately I enrolled. And for three years, I was a full-time graduate student in my late forties and a three quarters time law professor and a full-time trial lawyer. And when I finished my master's degree, I had been having discussions with my law partners about what I could do with it. And we couldn't, we couldn't reach agreement. And finally, uh, one of my colleagues gave me an ultimatum on a Friday. And that Monday, I walked into his office and I quit. And I gave one week's notice and walked out, leaving $10 million US on the table and just Ooh. walked out and started my, own, started my own peacemaking practice. Yeah. Wow. So okay. that's how it started. That's how, yeah, that's how that's done. I get, I guess like it comes to a point. I was just, I was just thinking about Dave Chappelle when you said you walked away from like 10 million. I know like he walked away from a lot and literally like, and walked away and, and created this whole other career. Well, not other career, but you know, now he's just, you know, he's, he's become, he's so successful, you know? Uh, and it's like, I feel like like what you're saying, like sometimes you come to a point where it's like, there's a limit, right? We all have a limit doesn't matter how much money someone can put on the table if you've come to that point where it doesn't feel like that's how you can live anymore the other thing has more purpose you will just walk correct you know for many many years i was living um a disintegrated life on the one hand i was a lawyer very successful making a lot of money mm. uh you know the big car the big house all the usual stuff and but on the inside i was pursuing a more introspective, contemplative, spiritual practice. And the, and the two parts of my lives never really were integrated. Yeah. And I think that's part of what drove me away from the law and into peacemaking is because mm -hmm. once I left the practice of law, I could start to integrate my life until today. I'm fully integrated and live an amazing life. And so I want to ask you how... Um, you have this program called prison of prison of sorry <laughs> prison of peace program, and from my understanding is that yeah, you teach inmates how to de-escalate conflict, being a mediator and calming down someone who is angry. Which I'm sure if any of us were in prison, we'd be pissed off like every single day. I mean, you know, it's not it's a, it's a you know it's it's a horrible place to be in. Um, it really caught my attention, and I wanted to ask. How did that program come about? In 2000, in August of 2009, I received a phone call from my colleague and dear friend, Laurel Coffer, who is a mediator in Los Angeles. And she said, you got a minute? And I said, yeah. And she said, I'm going to read you this letter. So she read me a letter that had been written by a woman serving a life sentence without possibility of parole mm. in, the in the largest, most violent women's prison in the world, which was Valley State Prison for Women in Chowchilla, California, about an hour, hour from where I live. And she was basically asking if Laurel would be willing to come in and teach the networking group, which is a group of about 100 women serving life sentences, to be peacemakers and mediators because so they could stop the prison of violence, stop the prison violence. They were tired of the violence. They were living there for the rest of their lives. Yeah. They wanted a peaceful community and they wanted to know how to stop it. And so we, Laurel and I talked about it, and she said, what do you think? And I thought about it for about a nanosecond. I said, you know, if this is the real deal, Laurel, I think we should do it. Mm. 
So that's how it started. And uh, six months later, in April of 2010, we were in the prison training our first cohort of 15 women. And uh, today, here we are 22 years later, it's hard to believe, 23 years later, we are in 15 California prisons, 20 California prisons, a, a prison in Connecticut, 15 prisons in Greece, and we've got startups in Italy and in Nairobi. And we'll soon, that later this year, we'll be going worldwide. Wow. Because we, we, during the pandemic, since we were not able to be in prisons, we mm. took the time and we filmed our entire curriculum. And now we're in post-production and writing up the manual so that by mid to late summer, anybody in the world that wants to start a prison of peace project in a local institution will be able to do so. And we'll be able to provide the uh, provide the curriculum with subtitles in any language in the world. Can I ask you, before I actually go into the work, I just really wanted to ask you this, like, like when you when you go to those prisons and and when you when you do, when you run your program, do you ever think about if that person is guilty, have they or what crime they've committed, or does it absolutely you from that standpoint like it does not matter at all? You're just here to make their life like what was what's your mindset like when you walk in like that? We we have made it a conscious policy to not care about why people are in prison or what they've done. We know that many of our students have committed homicide. They've killed human beings, mm -hmm. but we don't care. And we don't ask questions. They're there for a reason. And we're there to teach them how to be peacemakers and mediators, regardless of why they are there. So we, we really don't care. And are you ever worried about your safety? Never, not once. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When we compare to other places like in Europe, like US has got such a very strict like, I mean, people go into prison for a very long time. Yes. I know it's there for a reason, but it's if it's really, really harsh compared to other places. If you compare Compar to Denmark, yeah, you can even, there's no comparison between Denmark and the US, for example, in terms of prison sentences. And of course, you know, it, it, like, like anywhere in the world, people can end up there and they're, they're actually innocent or there was so much context around it. They had no other choice than to get to where they, you know what I mean? Like, there's so much involved that, you know, often by the time they get there, we've also let them down in society, you know. Um, so, yeah, I like that you said that you don't, it, it doesn't matter. Like you're just there to to help them make their life easier. So so when you, because obviously prison is a very unique environment. I mean, it's, it's you cannot even compare it to lockdown. It's like lockdown and you cannot, you don't even have the key to your door, you know. Um, like you can't just walk out and, go to the shop and buy some bread <laughs> like it's game over like how so that's a very extreme environment like how like how did you when you started off that program like how did you even manage to sort of even relate to how what they're going through prisons are full of conflict because they're very unnatural mm. places yeah. you're cramming people together into very small spaces that don't know each other who are have problems to begin with they're antisocial to begin with which is why they're in prison mm. and you're you're asking them to coexist in a situation where they have no privacy and no freedom uh and so conflict is is inevitable so we knew this going in and we designed the curriculum to take that into account and also to take into account that our students probably had zero skills of any kind that would make them effective peacemakers. So we had to start training them from the very bottom as if they knew nothing and, and slowly build up their skills until we could finally train them to be mediators and peacemakers. And, and so that's kind of, how, that's been our posture and our, our assumption from the very beginning. And it's turned out to be quite correct. Um, and we've been very successful at it. We've had, I, we probably had over 7,000 inmates of ours that we've taught in California that have been released on parole. And we don't have, we, we know of no, none of, we don't know of any of our students who have been released from prison who reoffended. As far as we know, we have a zero recidivism rate for our, for our students. And what would you think that is? It's well, first of all, it's remarkable because the recidivism mm, rate yeah. in California is like 80%. Eighty percent of the people that are released reoffend, and we don't have any of our students reoffending. 
And the reason is because we change them as human beings. They change as they become peacemakers. We're teaching them skills that are so powerful that it completely rewires their brains. Can you say some example of those? Like what, what is it that, what's the change that you see? The very first skill that we teach our students is how to listen. And the deepest, li there are four levels of listening and we teach them the four levels, but the deepest level is called affect labeling, how to listen to emotions. Mm. And what happens is when they learn to ignore the words and only listen to emotions and then reflect back those emotions, they reawaken their own humanity because they, they for, for all their lives, they have stuffed down their emotions to become numb and emotionally detached and emotionally unavailable to themselves because emotions hurt too much. They've never been emotionally safe. And once we teach them how to create emotional safety within themselves and emotional safety with other people, their humanity comes out and they become human beings again. Do you know, you just dropped a bombshell because that is like, that is like, I believe in that What like, like us, like I can't even put a percentage on it. It's so high. Um, and I didn't think of it necessarily in that scenario before, but like, this is not to obviously diminish what we're talking about, but like, for example, in, I see this a lot when watching stand-up comedy and how people react, people are very much about the words and then they'll forget the context. They forget actually the intention of the comedian behind it, their heart, what they, why the, the intention behind that joke. And people are getting really bugged down on words and they're not listening to the actual message, like, and, and the tone. And I mean, does that, does that, am I being flippant when I say this? In, in this oh, case? no. I mean, I mean, I, the, I call it learning how to list, learning how to listen other people into existence. Mm -hmm. People have a deep need to be emotionally safe, which they never got in their family of origin. Uh, families are inherently emotionally unsafe places for a whole bunch of people. <laughs> yeah, you so, yeah, you just said something. There. Yeah, go on. <laughs> Sorry. They are inherently unsafe. Ninety-six percent of all families are emotionally dysfunctional, and they produce emotionally dysfunctional adults. Mm -hmm. Well known, well known. Um, I mean, what do you think keeps therapists in business exactly. and and peacemakers? Uh, so, so people have never experienced emotional safety, and people have never felt deeply heard and validated. So when you learn this foundational skill of how to listen another person into existence, you actually are giving a gift that's priceless. And what's even greater is the gift costs you nothing to give. It actually benefits you to give the gift, mm. to listen to somebody into existence. You actually benefit when you do it. And it didn't. it doesn't take long for all of my students, whether they're serving prison sentences or they're in corporate world or they're in government, wherever they might be, it doesn't take them long once they start to practice to realize that this is the foundational skill of life. Once you learn this skill, everything in your life changes forever. So, okay. So, so if we would take like a, an example that, that may not feel as um, intense as like, you know, fighting with a prison mate, because like you were saying, like, you know, listening to the emotions and not, not necessarily like the words. Like, I, I, I believe in that. But I also know that for me, that's a very difficult thing to do. You know, let's say you're in, in a couple or you're someone that you, or a friendship, like, you know, a friendship and you have a, uh, let's say you have a fight or something, like you, you, you're arguing. And if they call you names or they say something that's like, they, they know it's like there's something you're insecure about or whatever it is, right? It's really hard to ignore the words and just to go, wait, I'm feeling, like I can see they're not feeling safe. They feel they have a deep sadness. They just want my attention. I mean, you know what I mean? Like that's something you can do like in a therapy session. But like when you're in the midst of it, it's very difficult to not react to it or to not get mad back or to not cry or, you know, to not get anxiety around it. So how, like, how does that even work in reality? It's actually quite easy to ignore the words once you learn how to do it. So what you just have mean? to be trained. You you have to you just have to learn how to do it. Could you give us a little insight? You literally ignore the words. It becomes white noise. You turn your ears off. 
and you don't even listen to people. They're shouting and screaming at you. They're spitting angry at you. They're calling you all kinds of names. Those words mean nothing to you. Don't give it power. Now, this is contrary to, this is contrary to a lot of cultural programming. From the time we were taught as small children, you have to listen to the words and pay attention. <laughs> don't be rude. Yeah. You have to ignore all that programming. You have to reprogram yourself to completely ignore everything that you think you know about listening. You're, the words just don't mean anything. It's just noise. It's white noise. And then once you do that, and it doesn't take long to figure out how to do it, you just you just stop paying attention to the word. You don't ignore the person. You just ignore what they're saying. And then and then that gives you that gives you the bandwidth to be able to read their emotional data fields and start understanding the emotional experiences they're having, which we can also do effortlessly because our brains are hardwired for that. But how? I guess is it like, I mean, because how do you not listen to, how do you switch it off, right? Make it into white noise and then they stop their spiel, expecting you to have, <laughs> to, to be able to, you know, basically like, you know, look like you, you were listening to them. But if you white noise them, you're not going to know what they said. So how, you don't have to, how does that Angie function? You don't have to know what they said. They're, what they saying is what they're saying is not important. Yeah, but so well, how do you respond back? So let's say they they've, they've done their rants. All right, let's, let's tell you what. Let, the easiest way to do this: a picture is worth a thousand words. So what mm -hmm. I want you to do is tell me a story of something that happened to you in the last couple of days that has some emotion uh, emotionality to it. it. Doesn't have to be a big deal, but just some emotion. I'm going to show you exactly. You're going to experience what this is like, and then we can talk about it. How's that? Oh, so like like I've I've haven't had any arguments though. No, I don't care about an argument, but ah. did. Anything that happened to you where maybe you got a little frustrated or a little upset, or even if you were happy. Oh, yeah, actually, happy. There's, there's one. <laughs> okay, tell me the story, and I'm just going to show you how this works. I mean, it's no we'll big deal, it. but I'll tell you, actually, it, it did annoy me. Um, I mean, this new job, I've got a day job. I mean, this new job, really love it. It's been great. It's been actually like a haven, like a shelter compared to... So you're, to really excited, you're really excited about your new job and you just love it to death and it's just been a lifesaver for you. Yeah, I wouldn't go that far as it's my passion. But like, yeah, like it's like, it's a, you know, it's like, it's, it's actually good. Like it's nice. I'm enjoying it. Um, and um, there's this one girl who's been there for a while and uh, she's been... I noticed that she got a bit offended by some of the things that in the group meeting, something came up, but it wasn't towards her. And so after that, that finished, um, I basically checked in with her. I said, Hey, are you okay? Like, you know, um, she goes, Oh, no, no, no. and I said, Oh, that wasn't, that wasn't geared towards you. This was just like a general statement around, um, micromanagement. And then, um, and I noticed that later on, like we were just chatting and she then went back to it but then she changed it and started to talk about something different about communication and she was sort of like a bit bashing the group and i was not comfortable with that because uh, i'm still new and she was ruining my experience <laughs> so you were so you were so you were reaching out to this woman to try to help her process what was going on and mm -hmm. then uh, you know she she wasn't able to process it and she started really disrespecting the group mm -hmm, and you mm -hmm. you felt you felt disrespected and just uncomfortable and a little sad that she was able to process this and spoiling what was for you a very positive and uplifting and and mm -hmm. experience and i asked i asked i said to her, i was i sort of managed to stop her i said let's talk about this another day and then another day came and i was doing a train like i was training her on the software and and then at the end, she just couldn't help it. She just started going on and she was like on and on. And I said, and I basically like, and I asked her, and then basically I asked her to, to start because I'm not comfortable. I feel like it's negative, like towards the group and I'm really enjoying this experience. And then she did it again one more time and I asked her again to stop. And I'm just like, if she does it again, like it's like a boundary crossing for me. Yeah. So you're getting frustrated because she continues to disrespect mm -hmm. the group. Mm -hmm. and insult the group and it's mm -hmm. a group that you admire and are, are proud to be a part of mm -hmm. and it's upsetting to you that she is raining on your parade and you know, you've asked her to stop and she's refusing and so now you're <laughs> feeling even a little insulted and disrespected and wondering how you're going to set a stronger boundary with her yeah and so you're a little confused about that and not sure quite what the next step will be for you yeah or just avoid her 
Like I've noticed yeah, that she she crosses boundaries with other people too. Like I've seen her do that, but like she yeah. does it in such a soft way. It's like almost like passive aggressive. Right. So you're seeing you're seeing her <laughs> violate boundaries and become passive aggressive, and mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. your strategy may be that you just have to avoid her. Yeah, which is obviously not not very like it's not very mature, is it, to just avoid? Right. Mm -hmm. I can't avoid her because she's in the same team. Right. Good. Anything else? That's it. All right. So what did you experience during that? interchange no you listen to me but it's not the same as if like if i was to i guess like what i'm thinking about is more like if you're in a, in a really bad argument like i'm just thinking like of a relationship i had where he had like he, he didn't couldn't really control his temper and he was very big and very tall so it's quite he didn't need a lot to be quite scary and so when he used words or was you know being very whatever then it's hard not to hear his words because they cut really deep so I wouldn't, that, that's what I mean. Like, that's where, like, oh, well, her it, I can ignore because she's not, I don't have a relationship with her. Like, I'm not, you know what I mean? Like, we don't, we're not a couple or anything like that. Okay, so here's the difference. The difference is in your skill level and how much experience you have. When I teach this, people how to do this, mm. I tell them to go out and practice in socially safe, low-risk situations. Yeah. Where they can practice listening to and reflecting emotions and if they make a mistake, they make a mistake. No big deal. They can learn from it and continue to grow. And after a couple of weeks of practicing on strangers in low-risk situations, like at a Starbucks or a restaurant or at a store with a checkout clerk, then people can start trying it out with their friends. Again, in low-risk, low-emotion situations and just see kind of like what we were just doing. Mm. And then you, as you gain experience and you gain confidence, you are slowly able to build up your skill level so that you can take on that very ag verbally aggressive, difficult person mm -hmm. who tends to shout and scream and threaten mm -hmm. and might otherwise be scary. And once mm -hmm. you build up to that, uh, you know, and you're ready for it, it's not a big deal. You see them for who they are. This is just an emotional person having an emotional moment. And I know exactly yeah. how to deal with this. Yeah. And there's no reason for me to get upset about it. Mm -hmm. It's not about me. It's about them. Yeah. Yeah. No, I hear you. And also, like, it's not because it was, like, a bad person. It's just, like, just like you know. I mean, we're, I mean I'm mean, i an emotional person, too. So I just don't like argument. I don't like conflict. It makes me super uncomfortable. It makes me sick to my stomach. Um, and I don't like to be challenged in that way because I don't like that person I become. Right. So that's simply because you have not been trained mm. in how to deal with high conflict situations. No, it's just, I, it's, yeah. it's a skill to be learned. And you, you, you I, I said earlier, families are 96% emotionally dysfunctional. Parents don't know how to teach their kids how to respond to conflict appropriately. You don't learn it in childhood. You don't learn it in school. You don't learn it in professional work. You just, Plain don't learn it. And mm. there are there are skills that teach you how to deal with other people's aggression and their anger and their upset. Mm. And yeah. you learn those skills just like you learn riding how to ride a bicycle. And it's, it's not in it. You have to be taught these skills. You cannot go a read, you, you can't even read my books and learn these skills. You have to mm. be taught. And and once you learn it, then everything changes. And you there is no more conflict. There are no more arguments. There are no more fights and arguments. Yeah, they, they go away forever. Yeah, and I think also, I mean, I don't know what you think, but it's like, like some things for some people, like for example, something for me would not even be a problem to get into. Like, I love debating. I love conversations. I love. I I, I have no issue being proven wrong. Uh, I may be a bit proud for a second. Do you know what I mean? But like, I'm not. But there's certain things where like, oh, I don't know how to handle that. Like, you know, so I think we all have our own, I guess, like points of like triggers that just doesn't feel comfortable in that area. We're just like, oh, my God, I can't like just I'm going away. Um, so, I mean, you, you do have we all. Have, well, until you start learning how to change your triggers to reprogram your brain, everybody mm -hmm. carries their childhood baggage with them. Yeah. Child, there are very few human beings that come out of childhood not emotionally wounded in a deep way. Mm. Very few. Even the most loving parents. Oh, yes, abused. it's not the parents' fault at all. Uh, like, it's not their no. fault, but they don't know any better. Mm -hmm. And they engage in this process known as an emotional invalidation, not knowing that it is incredibly abusive. 
And all parents do it because it's what they knew and what they learned and their parents did it to them. And this goes back for thousands of years. So what do you mean by emotionally invalid- emotional invalidation? So do you remember when you were very young, maybe you were two or three years old and you weren't running around <laughs> and you fell down and you scraped your knee and it started to bleed and you started to cry. Uh-huh. What were you told? Well, I don't remember that age. Okay. Have you ever seen little children fall over and scrape their knee and start to cry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and what are, they to- what are they told by their parents or well, the depends. adults? it depends. I mean, what do they some, say? Guys, some people say, like, oh, it's okay. Don't cry. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. Don't cry. Be a big boy. Be a girl. Mm. Put your big girl panties on. Right, right. That right. is incredibly emotionally invalidating. That child is having a series of emotions. And what that child is being told is it is not okay to cry. It is not okay to be scared. It's not okay to hurt. It's not okay to experience any of this. And if I want to be like the big people, I have to stuff all of my emotions inside and not feel anything. Do you know how abusive that is? Yeah, I mean, it's not, yeah, I guess. And that happens to every single child. Mm, mm -hmm. So by the time that child reaches adolescence, The child does not feel emotionally safe, has built up huge walls around emotions, is either emotionally numbed out or is emotionally unavailable or has no clue how to respond to other people's emotions. Many kids, that's why many kids move into addiction and addictive disorders and other bad behaviors because they have so much pain inside themselves because they have, have to suppress their emotions in order to be accepted in the family that it comes out in really bad ways. Mm. And why are relationships so difficult? Because the people that are coming into the relationship are like children emotionally, because they've never been coached how to develop their emotional competency. And rather than be emotionally competent adults, they come into relationship and, and they're basically stuck at six years old. And so when things get tough in a relationship, they get triggered, they go back to being six years old, And that's the programming they rely on because they don't have anything else. And they're not trained how to be emotionally competent. And that's why there's so much disaster and unhappiness in relationships and in the world in general. Mm. I mean, I think, I think there's probably like a, a bit of a balance, right? Because there's also the other way where, you know, this is my theory, like, you know, where maybe parents are, you know, um, it's basically younger generation than me for sure where where the whole thing was like validate everything about the child right like every emotions everything and i feel no and once they've become wait wait, wait once they, <laughs> once they've become adults they can't handle anything like this is i, I feel that that side has also it's also sort of become you- maybe one of the reason why If someone has, you, you can't ask questions or people get so emotionally heightened, it's like us against them, that kind of mentality, uh, whichever way, whichever side of the spectrum someone is standing politically or, any, or anything else, it doesn't matter, but they become so extreme on both sides that they're both as, you know, horrendous as each other just because they cannot talk, they cannot handle being questioned on anything, they can't handle, not even being questioned, just a question about things, they can't have conversations. And, and I would agree with you, and I would argue they have been just as emotionally invalidated as everybody else. By being if they were, if they had been, co- if they had been coached in emotional competency, they wouldn't have a problem with other people's upset. They'd be able to tolerate diversity. They'd be able to tolerate different b- beliefs. They wouldn't have identity crises. So, how, what's the difference between? Because I, I was saying like they were being overly validated, like they just valid- no. they're validated on everything. They're not. Said, what they're and then all of a sudden, like they. It's only their way or no way. They are, but, the, but what you're confusing validation for getting a gold star for showing up, which is not validation. And helicopter to... parenting, you know, you, I, the, there's, that's the confusion. Emotional validation, all the studies show that when you emotionally, inval- when you emotionally validate children, amazingly powerful things happen in their brains. You start emotionally invalidating a child at about four years old, In five years, that child is going to be two to three grade levels ahead of his or her peers. And it's going to have the emotional maturity five years older than what they are chronologically. So I think I'm a little bit lost. Sorry. Like I feel like, so, because I guess like what I'm, 
what I mean is like when when basically what, what, everything what, that the child does is like amazing. It's okay, no, no matter how badly being yeah, and that's are, not they're just they're being allowed to just like you know that is not you emotion- can't say no to a child. That's not emotional. That's not emotional validation. So what was that? So what? So I have, what I have no difference? idea what it is, but it is ah, not okay. emotional validation. You don't tell a kid who does nothing that just shows up to a soccer game. Oh, you're amazing. You showed up at the soccer game here. Have a gold star. You win a trophy for just showing up. Mm-hmm. That's not validation. That is whatever it is. It's awful. That that destroys children, too, because they don't learn any sense of independence. Mm-hmm. Children have to be allowed to make mistakes. They have to fail. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. You have to learn that failing is failing is okay. Mm. To your point, many, many parents did not allow their children to fail, did not allow their children to experience negative emotions. They denied them negative emotions by ma- trying to make them feel good all the time. That's not validation. That's crippling. It's emotionally crippling to do that. It's actually, cu- you know, cuddling is what we say. Like not, not, not like a tud- not like a cu- not like a hug, but cuddling. Like yeah, basically yeah. Yeah, you, no, I I agree with you, and it's it, that's just as destructive as. Mm. And it's another form of emotional invalidation. But instead of putting a kid's emotions down, you are not allowing the child to experience any kind of any kind of emotional experience because it's mm-hmm. all, everything's always happy, positive, yeah, yeah, yeah yippee, yippee, skippy, you know, which is just as bad as as the negative. Yeah, because life is full of contrast. It's okay to that's have right. different emotions. Yeah, that's you're not right. supposed to always be and like that's on just a, as on it's high. just as it's just as it's just the flip mm-hmm. side of the coin, and it's just as destructive. So there was a few things that I read on uh, on your website. So, for example, there was things that, you know, like things not to do, which often were the sort of like the mainstream advice, right? And you were sort of explaining why not to do those things um, to calm someone down. So a lot of the times uh, what we're being advised out there is that if someone's upset or angry to use I statements, right? <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us like why? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> exactly. Why, why is that? Why is that bad? Why? Like, can you explain like, why is that? That doesn't work. Is that a form sure. of invalidation or? Well, it is a form of invalidation. And, but there's also this old thing called active listening. The term active listening was created by a guy by the name of Gordon Thomas, who was a psychologist out of the university of Wisconsin at Madison here in the US. And he was a contemporary of Carl, Ro- Carl Rogers, who was the great humanist psychologist in the 20th century. And without going through the whole history, um, Gordon uh, figured out, Thomas Gordon figured out that that a lot of conflict arose when people use blaming statements. Oh, you're just an idiot, you don't care, stuff like that. And so he wanted people to instead of blame another person for a bad behavior or an outcome is to is to use an I statement. So he wanted people to say something like, look, when you throw, when you leave your dirty socks on the floor, I feel really disrespected. And I'm also kind of tired because I have to pick up after you. When I have to pick up after you, I'm just exhausted and I feel resentful. Mm-hmm. And I feel, I just feel like it's just the whole, it's just really unfair. So you notice the difference the difference between that kind of an I statement where I'm asserting how I feel when you do something, you leave your dirty socks on the floor, that's perfectly okay. But what happened was that in the early 1960s, as what was known as the human potential movement got underway with Earhart seminar training and all this other stuff happening, especially here in California, uh, people misunderstood what Gordon was teaching and so they reconstituted, and they, there was a reason why they did it too, an unconscious reason, which I'll explain in a They reconstituted active listening to be something like this. So it would be something like, um, gee, Angie, what I think you're feeling is, or what I hear you saying is X, or Angie, what I what I think you're feeling is X. <laughs> I hate that. That, that, exactly that, that was a training, like, ad, ad verbatim, I got when I used to work in events, and they were said, one time as like a client, they said, oh, you know, if someone gets really annoyed, just say, I can, I see you angry. And I was like, in my mind, I was like, this is mental. If someone says to me, when I'm angry, that they see I'm angry, 
I'm like, that's not helping me. That's that's not actually calming that's me right. down. All it does is escalate. Mm -hmm. So th so why is it that, that that went the way it was? Again, it was a lack of a lack of understanding. But here's what's really going on. If we are untrained in conflict and untrained in listening to emotions, when another person becomes emotional in our presence, we and we are unconscious of our own emotional experience. In other words, we are not emotionally self-aware. We will oftentimes experience deep anxiety. And the one thing that a human being cannot handle is anxiety. So mm -hmm. we will do anything we can to get rid of our own anxiety. So the one mm -hmm. thing we'll say is, gee, Angie, what I think you're feeling is anxiety. Well, the reason that I'm saying that is because number one, it's passive in the English language, it's passive voice. So that's language of disconnection. I'm separating myself from you. And by using the I statement, I am self-soothing my own anxiety that you're creating by your emotionality. Mm. And act and 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 it just doesn't work. You just you said so, you said so yourself. The only you said when people use that stuff on me, it drives mm. me crazy. Yeah, I don't like it. Yeah. And nobody likes it. And yet it to this day. To this day, it is still taught to therapists and to people in my field in mediation and peacemaking. It's still taught as the way to, quote, actively listen. It's utter bullshit. And the more the, the, the most important thing to take away from this is never use an I statement when you are listening to somebody else. Only use a you statement. You're angry. Ang Angie, you're really frustrated and angry. You feel completely disrespected and unappreciated. Nobody's listening to you. You don't feel hurt. And it makes you sad. And you're anxious and worried and concerned. And you're a little embarrassed by it all. And you feel deeply betrayed. And at the end of the day, you feel abandoned and loved and unlovable. And all of that just really pisses you off. Well, when, I mean... Maybe that's maybe like overdoing it a little bit. Like, <laughs> so, well, you, you know, don't like, feel that like, way, but so I want to. Listen, listen. No, 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 no. I know, I know this wasn't towards me, but I was just, I was just, I was trying to think of it. Like, if I'm in a really, let's say, if I'm in a bad place, and someone was to like trail off all of that, I'd be like, oh my god, I'm really a loser. Like, it would help. It is better than the eye statements, but like, I think, like, isn't there also like a point where maybe like it depends on, like, on the audience, like who you're talking to, like, because I'm, I'm trying. No, it's, I'm, it's always, it's always contextual. And you always have to use discernment. But the point of me saying what I just said was to point out how all I did was use you statements. Yeah. There were no I statements there. Mm -mm. And the important thing to remember is that whenever you are reflecting, you're doing reflective listening. You must reflect from the speaker's frame of reference, not from your own frame of reference. I actually bet on what um, of what you just said. It, wouldn't you also like, what would be your advice if, you know, when someone's crying, people's um first reaction which infuriates me <laughs> to me um let's say um first you know sometimes like you just in a conversation all of a sudden you become vulnerable you didn't see it coming and all of a sudden you have these tears come up because you're like you've stuffed it down and then all of a sudden it came up and like and people are like oh don't cry oh and then they make it all about them i've got i know someone who's like that and it's like it sort of cuts it almost stops the opportunity of these emotions finally getting out of me, right? And it cuts it off and it makes you feel like as if, wait, now you're just making it all about you. For the, like, now I'm actually finally opening up and now you're cutting me off. Like, and notice, so people, notice, mm. notice two things that are happening there. The first thing is you're being emotionally invalidated. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's the mm. first. And so you're feeling like you're not being heard. In fact, you're, it's the opposite of being heard. You're being invalidated. Mm-hmm. And that person is invalidating you because she is trying to soothe her own anxiety yes. around your emotional upset. Exactly. And exactly. you pick that up and that makes that even pisses you off even more because it's no longer about you. It's about her. And she's being yes. very selfish. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and you just did the you statement on me and I felt really hurt. <laughs> gotcha. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting because um, that same person will then say in that same conversation, like, or within the same hour, go, you know, like, it's okay to like to open up to me, you can tell me stuff. And I'm like, well, I just tried. So yeah, you know I mean, it's like, you just cannot win. But I also understand, like, I'm not actually, 
uh, mad at her, angry at her. Like I understand that's her just not knowing how to to act. She thinks she can, but actually she can't. You know. She can't. She doesn't know how. She doesn't know how, and I think, and, and that's okay. Like maybe she she knows how to do that with someone else. Maybe it's just no, you know. No, 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 okay. no, no, no. Totally <laughs> unskilled. Doesn't have any clue how to listen. Yeah. And that's the way most people are. Where are you going to learn how? Where are you going to learn how? Unless you find somebody like me, who studies this stuff for a living, mm. and knows how to teach it. Where are you going to learn how to listen? Well, that's it. I mean, a lot of trial and error, and it takes a lot longer, right? So, like, you know, when someone's crying, actually, that was actually about um, all right. What I want to say is that you know, when someone's crying, um, so what know, are the emotions? Often, 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 no, but often, like the first reaction is that you want to go over and you want to hug them. But actually, I've also it is. But then we say, oh, it's okay, don't cry. Like we should get. What, what are you doing when you do right? that? What are you well, doing no, when I, you say that it's okay, don't cry? What are you doing? That's what I'm saying. It's invalidating. And, exactly. I believe, and I believe that actually when someone cries, I, f I think that the, the most respectful thing to do, unless they're asking you to hold them, the most respectful thing to do is to just sit and let them cry it out. Or maybe maybe they want the room alone, whatever it is, like depending where, where you're at with them. But sometimes when someone is, I guess like, where you, like you were saying earlier, when someone's angry, you just have to let them out, just white noise it. And when someone's crying... Is to just let them cry and just. All right, you've got right. The, the, the number one rule is to create emotional safety. Mm. Now you can create emotional safety just by holding a, a safe, silent, a sacred space. You can do that yeah. if you can hold a silent, sacred space without being anxious yourself. You're right; that can be effective. The second thing you can do to create emotional safety is to reflect back the emotions underlying the sadness, and you would say something like, "Oh, Angie, you're just devastated." You're feeling all this grief and sadness and loss. And you're you're beside yourself. You just don't you don't know what to do. You, you you're losing yourself. You feel like a part of you has been ripped away. And you're a little angry that you've been left all alone like this. And you're a little anxious and worried, but mostly it's just this deep, deep, deep grief that you're experiencing. Mm. And it's yeah. really, really cueing into you in a deep way. Well, it's hard not to get emotional listening to you. <laughs> you're really good. You're, you're really good. Um... It works. This, the, the, and, the, and, the re and the reason it works is because, because of how our brains are hardwired. There's all kinds of brain scanning studies that show why this works as well as it does. And unlike any other form of listening, this form of listening that I teach is absolutely validated by empirical science. There's nothing else out there that has been tested and brain scanned through fMRI studies like this, nothing. But you know, this is so interesting because, uh, I mean, this may not be this may not be everyone's experience, but often I feel like what's the hardest bit, like the hardest part, like not the hardest part actually, it's not the hardest part, but one of the, I guess, what makes some, what makes um, grief or heartbreak or betrayal, anything like that longer or harder to maybe heal or to process I think it's when you feel like you're not entitled to your emotions or to how you're feeling and so you're not sharing it because you think that people are gonna you worry that people are gonna think you're crazy right or that and you so, like overreact or that they just don't understand why you'd be this upset and, or why and, and, you you know exactly now let's let's mm. let's look at that a little bit this is you're exactly correct and why is it that we feel that like we're going to be judged or criticized or ridiculed or abused or looked down upon for our emotional experience? Mm -hmm. Because we don't live in an emotionally safe place. We have been mm -hmm. taught from the time we were very, very small children that emotions are evil. Emotions are bad. Emotions are weak. Emotions are irrational. That you cannot be a full functioning human being if you're emotional. If you're emotional, then you're just a basket case. You're a drama queen. That's what we're told, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, and, yeah. And, I mean, yeah. And, yeah. and the science is this. The science is that we are 98% emotional and only 2% rational. We can't even be rational unless we're emotional first. We can't even make a decision. There's no such thing as an unemotional decision. Every mm -hmm. decision is emotional. I agree. And yet our culture, going back for thousands and thousands of years, has taught us that emotions are bad, emotions are evil, emotions are weak. And yet it's emotions that make us human. Only, only humans have emotions.
Dogs don't have emotions. Cats don't have emotions. Gorillas don't have emotions. They have something else. What they have is affect. They have biophysiological reactions of pleasantness and unpleasantness. Oh. And we have them too. We're born with affect too. We're not born with emotions. Humans have to create emotions. Emotions are cognitive constructs that we have to create starting at about 18 months of age. And because we grew up in emotionally dysfunctional families, that growth process is often is almost always distorted and perverted, which is why there is so much misery in adulthood. Wait, I feel like you said something really, really major, and I'm just, I just, I just need like to wait one second to just digest, because I know there's, I, I have a question, but I just need to sort of, um, with the affect and the emotion, that's really interesting. So here's, let, let's capture what I just said, and I'll, I'll summarize it very briefly. Yeah. All animals have affect. Affect are the biophysiological responses to the environment that are that cause either a feeling of pleasantness or a feeling of unpleasantness. All animals have affect. So when you see a dog that's happy, that dog is having what's known as an affective experience. But the dog does not have emotion. Only humans have emotions. And emotions are created starting at about 18 months of age, as the emotional centers of the human brain start to mature. And children, little children, toddlers, have to learn how to take the affect they've been experiencing for the last 18 months of life and move that affect into categories that we call emotions. So we have nine affect and that are hardwired into us. And those and that aff, those affect are either positive, neutral, or negative, and they are either intense, moderate, or low in terms of their intensity. Think about affect as an artist's palette of primary colors. An artist can take a palette of primary colors and from that create infinite number of varieties of colors. The human brain can take these nine affect and create an infinite variety of experiences of a combination of pleasantness and unpleasantness. And we, when we name those different experiences, we are creating emotions. So it's called, we create a, what's known as an emotional database. And when, once we can turn affect into emotion, we can then start drawing inferences about what caused us to have that experience. Can't do that with affect. We can also uh, communicate we can become aware of what's going on. So that's emotional self-awareness. And most importantly, we can communicate, we can make decisions about what we're going to do with this experience we're having, and we can communicate what we're experiencing to other people. No other animals on the planet can do those four or five things with affect. So we concretize it into consciousness so it becomes self-aware. We can draw inferences about what's causing me to feel this way. We can start making decisions about what do I want to do with this feeling that I'm having? And how do I communicate what I'm feeling to somebody else? That's the power of emotion. And yet it's denied to us because our culture says that emotions are weak. And as in our upbringing, we're taught that emotions are bad. Don't you can't feel emotion. You can't, you have to stuff it, especially negative emotion, especially it's okay to be happy, but it's not okay to be sad. It's not okay to be angry as a child. It's not okay to be frustrated. All those negative emotions are, they're suppressed. And we learn, we learn, we learn that emotions are not safe. And so we wall them off and we deny ourselves the experience of those emotions as adults which then leads to horrible relationship problems later in life. You were talking earlier about this big guy that was your boyfriend or, mm -hmm. and he got scary at times because he would mm -hmm. get violently angry. Well, he wasn't violent. I wouldn't say that, but he just, yeah. But he's, he, okay, he verbally. Raise, yeah. He didn't have to raise his voice that much to be. Intimidating, like, intimidating yeah. I mean, and possibly. Just, even just walking down the street, no one, no one would ever. I know, understand. I, him. I'm yeah, a big man that. too. I, so I understand mm. what that's about. Yeah. He, um, so if he got even even raised his voice a little bit mm. and started to become verbally aggressive, yeah. But 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 
I'm going to guess that he he is not emotionally competent. He is not emotionally self-aware. And when he becomes angry or upset, he is simply playing back the childhood programming that he had at six years old. And he's completely unconscious about what he's doing. He's just reacting. He's, he's, he's working through the program. And I did the same. I did the same in different ways. I also replayed whatever you know to him. So like I, I, I'm just as yeah. It wasn't just him. Right. We all do until we learn, until we learn how to be emotionally competent. Until we learn emotional competency, this is what our lives are like. We're slaves. We're slaves to our emotions. They dominate us, and we have to learn how to control them. We have to learn how to manage them. We have to learn how to become aware, how to self-regulate. So I just want to bring awareness to this. Is like, like even like I remember like years and years ago, um, I used to get like really bad anxiety, and there were some particular triggers that would get me like mm -hmm. it was you know get me physically got physically uncomfortable, and um, something that I learned uh, because I was always trying to avoid it, like something I was trying to distract myself, you know. Um, it was even unconscious, and I'd come up and I'll just try and you know get a distraction somehow so I wouldn't feel it. Until I was taught to just go home as, as fast as you can, whenever it happens, if you can, if not, just get yourself distracted. Um, but once you're home and just really feel into it and just let all of that ickiness come up and Good. it's really scary place to be in. Good. But it was like, and it, there was a whole method to it. Like I wouldn't just tell that's someone to right. just do it. Like there's a whole method to it that, you know, yeah. so I had like a whole guideline. Yeah. And that's when I, I, I realized that you have to really go into the darkness. That's right. To see the light. It's not like that's, that's not some right. hippie whoopee. That's right. It's not flipping what I'm saying. Like it's really. No, uh -uh. You're exactly right. Because it's by suppressing feelings. Because I, I was an expert at suppressing feelings until I couldn't suppress them any longer. And so, and so, yeah, it's the opposite. Like really, you just have to feel it. And I think the skill is like when you are in a highly emotional situation, like when you are in a couple, when you, when you are, when you like, when you, when you have these strong feelings for someone and you, you're close to them or you feel close to them, then it's about not letting those, like it's about feeling it and making sure you don't let it out on them because no one is an emotion should not be your emotional punching bag. And I talk to myself as well when I say that, like, but I think like a lot of the time when you see people being triggered, whether it's on social media or any kind of environment now, that's kind of like why I guess like what I was referring to before, but I was expressing, expressing it really badly is that when you see people being triggered, instead of using that as a gift, because it really, really is a gift. It's like crap inside of you trying to come out instead of feeling it and going what is what is this about why is what that person said to me triggering me why has that word got so much power which is i know something that also you said earlier right is that they just lash out onto people and they try to shame them and cancel them whatever they can do right they're trying to like get them fired or whatever it is they're not looking at what's really 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 going on inside and i'm not saying people should get away with terrible behavior i'm not saying that or saying whatever they you know pleases them all the time but i think there's a lot of missed opportunities out here because the trigger now i see them as like ooh, why is this bothering me like even with that girl that um, that woman at work I was telling earlier, I know why she's is triggering me because I feel like I found a safe place work-wise that I hadn't had in a while. And now she's like ruining it for me. <laughs> you right. know, I don't want it. Like I would right. not let that happen. You know, right. that, that's well, what's really going I, on. I, I completely agree with everything that you're saying. One, you have to dive into those dark, icky emotions to process them. Two, you've got to be able to, I, I run my students through a whole process of how to identify their triggers and then reprogram their brains around those triggers in, in the way that you're talking about. And you have to go through that process to get clear of all that stuff. And then you have to learn how to become emotionally self-aware of your own emotional experience. And the way you do that is by labeling your emotions as they arise. So you could say, oh, I'm really angry right now. I'm really frustrated. I feel disrespected. I don't feel like I'm being listened to. You just label your own emotional experience. And just by doing self affect labeling, a lot of this stuff happens automatically. You literally reprogram your own brain.
And it's the fastest way to calm down. If you're upset about something, the fastest way to calm down is to just take a moment and just label what you're feeling. What am I feeling right now? What are the emotions that I'm feeling? And that means that you want to build up your vocabulary so that you can associate your experiences with words. That's called emotional granularity. And the more, the deeper your emotional granularity, the more self-regulated and self-aware you are. And it's a simple practice. You just have to learn it which is why I teach it. And this is how we have been able to teach murderers to become peacemakers because we teach them, we teach them these practices. Yeah. I mean, that's incredible. Like I actually, I do have, I actually do have a little bit of a range of questions about the experience with the inmates. Um, but like, I, I just thought also like, you know, everything that it's just such an important conversation anyway that, that, that we had, I just, before we go into the, the work with the inmates, I want to ask you two questions based on what we just spoke about. You know, because obviously we're not always going to be good at, especially at the beginning, we're going to, it's going to be clumsy, right? Trying to name our emotions or being self-aware, not just being triggered and react to the situation or to the person when it's got nothing to do with them. So how do we not like beat ourselves up? And that's why I don't like getting into conflict because I hate how I feel after because I'm like, I did that, you know, I made them upset and I don't like that. If you, if you engage in behavior that you, that shames you or embarrasses you mm. the best thing that you can do is feel say i'm embarrassed i feel embarrassed i feel shame around this right now i feel ashamed and embarrassed and i'm a little sad at myself because i'm better than this mm. and, I, and i haven't let it to who i am and then you say but i still love myself and it's it's okay it's okay to feel shame it's okay to be embarrassed it's okay to be sad because I'm still a good person. Mm. And then it goes away. You don't feel it anymore. Yeah. What happens is, as you said earlier, when we repress our feelings of shame, embarrassment, humiliation, sadness, because it's painful to experience, those are painful, painful emotions. When we suppress it to avoid the pain, we don't process it. Mm. And then it just creates all kinds of other difficulties for us. Yes, so, that, yes. so you express your emotions to yourself as you experience it. So that you can, and, and that way you release, you release the charge. Yeah. And, and I would say as well, like, um, that probably like, um, so the lines quite well with that first step, which is like, ignore their words, like white noise it, is to not hold it like against them or over and over again. So let's say they said something, they made, let's say they called you a bitch or whatever, right? And, and you know, some of us will remember that. <laughs> right. Um, uh, or whatever, like, but it's like how, I don't know if it's that, I don't know if, don't know if this is the right example, but. So let's, or, uh, let's suppose that somebody insults you. They call mm -hmm. you a bitch. Mm -hmm. Angie, you're just a bitch, self-centered mm -hmm. little bitch. All you do is care about yourself. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Pretty mean language. Yeah. So what you say, what you say to yourself is I'm feeling really disrespected right now. I feel insulted. I feel disrespected. I don't feel like I'm being understood. And it kind of makes me sad. And I feel a little bit of embarrassment that, about this because it's not doesn't comport with my identity of who I am myself. And that person's really angry and sad and alone and frightened. And all she can do is attack me. And I'm sad that I'm the punching bag, the target. You see how you process it? Just like that. And all of a sudden, the charge goes away. Mm. Once you identify your emotions, you become self-aware of them, you immediately start to self-regulate. Yeah, and I guess when you come from a place of calm as well, you can sort of like set a better boundary. What has the experience of working with lifers, some of their murderers, taught you about life and people? Well, I've learned a lot of humility. Um, I've learned also to be, I've learned that human beings are human beings and it doesn't matter whether behind bars or in prison or outside of prison, all human beings are the same. They all have the same basic needs. They all have the capacity for growth. Everybody has a capacity to change and grow. And it doesn't matter who you are or where you are. Yeah, there's a small percentage of people that are brain dysfunctional. There's 
sociopaths or psychopaths, you know, they got serious brain dysfunction. Those people need to be protected from themselves and other people. But for the most part, that does not describe the typical population of incarcerated people. And although all the the only thing that incarcerated people are missing that other people have is they just they didn't they didn't even get the basic skills of how to get along with people. They grew up in families of violence or families of anger. Mm-hmm. And they just learned or families of absolute zero love. And so they learned behaviors to cope with that that ultimately put them in prison. And when you when you when we teach them how to be a human being, which is what they have to be in order to be an effective peacemaker, and they learn that, they completely change. They completely change. Is there, is there like anything, so like in particular, like any, um, like a story that you have? Yeah, like let me. Let, uh, that uh, touched you or stayed with you? Uh, it's the very first story that I ever, that I tell all the time because it's one. Of, it was the first one, and it's also one of the most powerful. So we were in this first cohort of fifteen women. We were in about week five, I think, of our training. And, and Laurel and I walked into the training room, and which was very dark and dingy and dirty. And and the, there was a, a woman, one of our students, Sarah, sitting over in a corner. And she was quietly sobbing. So we were concerned and walked over. And Laurel kneeled down next to her and said, what's going on? And Sarah said, I've been in prison for 18 years. I'm serving a, I'm serving a, li- a 25-year life because... As a drunk driver, I killed a family of four. And in that accident, I came out without a scratch. When I came to prison, I had to give up my three-year-old boy to my sister, Therese. And I've written him every single week for 18 years. He's never called me. He's never visited me. He's never communicated with me. He's never written to me. All the information I get about how he's doing, I've gotten through my sister, his aunt. Earlier this week, I decided to write him a letter based on what you guys have been teaching, how to, and I wanted to listen him into existence. So I thought about all the feelings he must have been experiencing for, he's 21 years old now, all these feelings he's been experiencing from a mother who basically abandoned him and ended up in prison because she was an alcoholic and a drunk and cared more for herself than for her son. So I have this long letter thinking about everything that he must have experienced and writing it from a you perspective, not from my perspective. I was writing it from his frame of reference, just like you taught us. Well, today, I got my very first letter in 18 years from him. And he was very angry, as he should be. He has every right to be angry. But at the end, he said, I love you, Mom. P.S., I'm bringing my girlfriend, and we're going to come visit you in three weeks. Wow. And she started crying again. Yeah. And that's when I realized first realize the power of what we're teaching. Yeah. All he needed to do was be listened into existence. He simply needed to be heard by his mother. Yeah. And the estrangement went away. Yeah. No, that make, it makes a lot of sense. It really makes a lot of sense. <laughs> it really, really does. Um, yeah, he's being, it's, it's, it was her acknowledging what they did to him. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so... Once she acknowledged and listened to him into existence and acknowledged his emotions, then he was able to let go of his anger and wanted to be have a relation relationship with her again. Yeah. Was there ever like, you know, like is there any ever ever like anything like funny like that you have from this experience? Like maybe like, you know, odd situations that were quite funny and you didn't expect it from uh, working with the inmates. And now I'm putting you on the spot here. I didn't. I didn't send this question. Ahead no, of time. no. You know, I don't. I, you know, we've always had in our classes. We try to inject some humor and levity, and uh, you know, it's and we try to. Um, you know, there there are times when it's pretty tense and pretty dense because we're teaching them some very intense skills, but there are times when we have a lot of fun too. So it's it's like you know they're human beings. And, you know, every class is different. You know, I've taught, I've taught in maximum security prisons. I was teaching in a prison where Charles Manson was housed before he died. I was teaching 100 feet from his cell in one of the supermax prisons here in California. Mm-hmm. Wow. And, you know, you, 
it's all it but it's you know, prisons are prisons at least mm-hmm. in California and you know even in Connecticut they're different there was little difference between a, the Connecticut prison we work in and the California prisons it's just just a place where people are spending time yeah and yeah. you just and fortunately our students want to learn and we're there to teach them yeah yeah i mean it's all like you know and again you know it's like there's always there's there's all, you know there's always a reason why people end up where they are you know like there's right. it's not because people are um like evil inside or rotten inside you know and again we're not talking about like you know like right. you said, like, you know, a psychopath, social rights, where you, there's not really much you can, it's very hard to right. do. Uh, you know, anyone that's like a serial killer or things like that, like it becomes a bit more different. But, um, but yeah, you know, it's, um, yeah, I mean, life is, life is um, funny that way, you know, how people, how, you know, everyone's path and how, where you, you know, how you're born and stuff like that, how it can have an impact and how, and I, and I guess like a lot of things I was hearing from you, uh, with what you were saying, and a lot of it is also to do with like reframing things, right? Perception, um, because I think you know, like the same thing where the emotional emotional invalidation, where we like, you know, like all the children uh, experiencing. Actually, it is also like, and that, that's how that's how it obviously affected the child. But it's also actually it's it's a perception thing, right? We think, oh, we're not allowed, but actually the, the power is really loving and actually wanted you to be happy and keep you safe. So it's all about perception and and and, and how we look at things. Uh you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? We like we realize when we were grown up, oh my god, that's the place they were coming from or what was going on. Right, exactly. And we just in, internalized everything. Um so yeah i think um i mean I, I love to hear the fact that you said like you know people can change because i think that's often right. something that we don't want to believe right exactly mm-hmm. exactly and so um dog um i, I want to ask you the the two finishing thoughts that i ask all of my guests um and the first one is what do you wish you'd realized at 18 but like really understood on a cellular level not just cognitive like, what do you realize you wished, what do you wish you'd realize at 18? What do I, 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 I reframe the question for me, please. So, like, so if I was to reframe it, it'd be like, what, what life lesson do you wish uh, you'd learn sooner? Oh, God, I don't know. I don't think that I could have learned any lessons that I needed to learn any earlier than when I learned them. What I wish I had as a child is an adult who was wise enough to teach me what I needed to learn to be a competent adult. And I didn't have that. And so I had to make all the mistakes that everybody else makes. And it took many, many decades for me to learn those lessons. And I think that all could have been a shortcut if I'd had somebody competent to teach me as a young child how to grow up and be a responsible competent person but do you think that you would have had the skill of that empathy because you can relate to how other people are feeling what they're going through if you sort of had that all figured out so soon no i think empathy is a skill that has to be learned cognitive there are two times two kinds of empathy cognitive empathy and affective empathy they have to be taught And actually, until I just discovered the skill of affect labeling in 2005 and the brain scanning studies came out in 2007, the knowledge wasn't there for us to be able to do this. So this is all pretty new stuff. Yeah. And the the second question is, what stuff do you not put up with anymore? (laughs) What stuff don't I put up with anymore? Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, well, first of all, I don't suffer fools gladly. <laughs> uh, if I mean, I just don't tolerate people who are not good thinkers. Unless, you know, I mean, if, 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 I, I don't choose to be with those people, but if they, pay, if they want to engage me to help them, then, of course, I'll work with them. But um, I, don't tolerate, I don't tolerate muddled thinking very well. What does muddled thinking mean? People who, people who are not clear thinkers who have beliefs that are not founded in any kind of grounded reality. Very set in their ways. They're lazy. No, they're just lazy thinkers. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to rely on beliefs that other people feed them in order not to have to do the hard work of dealing with ambiguity. Mm 
ambiguity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we see part of the polarity that we see as, as a result of that. So I don't tolerate that. I don't tolerate politicians who are not leading me to a higher place. Right, right. Yeah. If a politician is going to lead me into a dark place, mm -hmm. I don't tolerate that. Yeah, people just somehow, they don't want to live in the gray. They just want everything to be black and white, like, yeah, very, yeah. Very dualistic. Yeah. Um, so before before you tell us where we can find you or work with you and buy your book, is there anything that else that you'd like to share with us? Like maybe I didn't we didn't get a chance to 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 go over. No, it's all good. Yeah. Yeah. So, dog, I just want to say thank you so much. Just thank you so much for you know for being game and you know doing this back and forth with me and being open and oh, and course. just you know right with the questions and. Like, I just really want you to share with us, like, where can people find and work with you, buy your book? Like, plug, give us all the good stuff. So I have created a web page, especially for anybody listening to this podcast. If you're not listening to this podcast, you will never find this web page. Okay. <laughs> and on that web page, you can get access to my fourth book, Deescalate. You can get a free ebook. So there's free. You can buy a video course how to calm an angry person, the, the, the de-escalate video course. And if you want to go deep, you can buy the basic and advanced emotional competency courses, how to do the things that we've been talking about in this podcast. And that link is Doug Noel, D-O-U-G-N-O-L-L dot C-O, not com, co, slash two dash old. Too old for this shit, right? Two. Yeah. <laughs> T-O-O dash old. And if you go to that link, it'll take you to a page, a special page on my website. And only your audience, people, all you people who are listening to this, only you people can get what's on that page. Nobody else. Yeah. So that, so go there. And then that will take you into the rest, rest of the rest of the website where you can go. I've got a lot of resources, a lot of articles, and you can just explore the website and You know, go to my, I've got a new YouTube, I have many YouTube channels, but my latest one is called The Power of Emotional Competency. So if you type in Doug Noel, D-O-U-G-N-O-L-L -L in Google, The Power of Emotional Competency, that's my new YouTube channel. And I'm populating it with videos that talk about all the things we've been talking about today. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Doug. Thank you so, so much. It really was a pleasure. And yeah, I can't wait to see what else you're gonna do. And I'm gonna check out the, you know, the, the new YouTube channel. So thank you so much. You're welcome. And that's our episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Please don't forget to rate, review, share it, subscribe it on iTunes, follow it on Spotify or whichever platform you listen from. However you show love is how you can support this show. Drop me your questions or suggestions for future episodes via the website at angie-s.com or come and find me on Instagram at Tool for Dish It Podcast. See you next week and until then. Using health inappropriately.